So study is a valuable way to get scripture into your head. And it's an important first step because if it isn't in your head, there's not a whole lot you can do further than that. But once you've introduced scripture into your head and you've got it going in your thoughts, at least regularly, there is another stage to go to. So today we're going to talk about Christian meditation. And of course, things being as they are, we can't have this discussion without starting out with what Christian meditation is not. If you go online and start poking around just under the word meditation, you'll find things like meditation has been practiced by many faiths across uh, the world through time, but it's less about faith. And it's more about altering consciousness or finding awareness, achieving inner peace. That's not Christian meditation, obviously. Because it's not about creating our own reality. It's not even about knowing ourselves better or even about achieving peace. That might be a series of side effects of it, but that's not the point. But you'll also find Eastern meditation, particularly Buddhist views of meditation, as, well, it'll sound about very similar. Uh, it's more about cultivating a wholesome frame of mind that eventually leads to perfect separation from all things, perfect emptiness. That's what they consider peace, is to empty yourself completely, to get rid of all turmoil and to accept everything as just being the way things are. That is also not Christian meditation. It is important that there should be some separation. Let me put it this way. Suppose you really loved peanut butter and you ate peanut butter daily, all the time, until one day your doctor says, I'm sorry, that's too high sodium, too high sugar, too high fat, you have to stop eating it so you can lose weight, right? Now, a lot of people would just close up the jar, put it in the cupboard, and leave it there, and probably sneak a little bit now and then, but you know, a little separation is fine. But think of it this way. Suppose you eat peanut butter every day and one day it gives you a violent allergic reaction. And your doctor says, if you eat peanut butter again, you are very likely going to die. Your views on separation from that are gonna be a bit different, aren't they? Because it's a matter of life and death. Now, we do not separate ourselves for meditation because it's a good, uh, <laughs> because, you know, every once in a while, you need a little break. You need a little, you know, a little space to breathe, to be. It's like, no, we separate ourselves because there's something else we need to have in our lives and the stuff we're separating ourselves from could actually kill us. What we're separating ourselves from are the things that get in the way of our relationship with God. And these aren't always necessarily, I mean, obviously you want to separate yourself as much as possible from sin because that's what really kills you. But distractions. One of the books I've been reading on these Christian disciplines, you know, spiritual disciplines for uh, um, godliness is um, the classic. Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. And one of the first things he says about preparing yourself for meditating is you should not be anywhere near a phone. And this was back in the 90s. Think about now the significance of being away from your phone. How many of you actually have it on you all your waking hours. 
and you can hold it up and say, oh, look, I've got it on me now. It's becoming increasingly necessary to create that space, but we're not creating space for its own sake. Like I said, when we started this, all of these disciplines are intended to make room for God. So when people are talking about things like altering your consciousness or finding deeper awareness or, you know, emptying out your mind, particularly the latter, the emptying out your mind, it always reminds me of a parable. Some of you might have guessed which one it is already. About a man who had a demon cast out from him. And the problem was, he didn't fill the space with anything else. So that demon went out and found some friends and came back. And the end of the parable is, that man's condition was much, much worse than it was at the start. So what we seek to do with meditation is to fill ourselves up with something. What are we filling ourselves up with? Well, here's a question for you. What does the voice in your head sound like? Everybody has one. And I guarantee you it belongs to whatever you spend the most time with. If you spend your time always, say, for example, watching the news, your voice is going to take place in 30 to 60 second segments. It's going to have absolutely no recollection of what happened a year ago or even six months ago. And it's going to always be sounding a note of alarm. If your voice comes from um, popular culture like movies, music, it's going to have a certain tone to it. It's going to focus on certain things, and you will be filled up with those things. And we know that whatever fills you up then spills out. It's all about where you get your view of the world, of yourself, and of each other. I want you to turn to Isaiah 30. There is a verse in Isaiah 30 that I stumbled across when I was still in high school, and I have had it underlined in every Bible I've owned. It's verse 15. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, oh no, we will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away. And we will ride upon swift seeds, therefore your pursuers will be swift. It struck me even early on that with God, repentance and rest, quietness and trust, sound a whole lot better than what follows when the comes. But there's a verse a little further on. If you look down at verse 20, after this, you know, they've been pursued, they have fled from their enemies, it talks about God being gracious to them. And that is something that you see again and again through the Old Testament, that they have rebelled, but God is gracious to them. And verse 20 says, though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher shall not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher. And this is the bit I want you to focus on. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. God gives the spirit to speak a word in our ears to say, go this way. No, go that way. The trouble is, we have to be listening. 
And when your ears are filled up with other voices, you're far less likely to hear the voice you need to hear. If you look at John chapter 16, we have a promise. Starting in verse 12 of chapter 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is a promise that I think we don't focus on enough that while he was even still on earth, he had more that he needed to say to his disciples. You think these men had walked with him, had sat down to table with him, had camped out on the road with him. They had talked to him more than anyone, but he still had more he needed to say to them. How much more then will he have more to say to us? but we need to have the right voice in our ears, in our head, filling our lives. Because the voice in your head, of course, becomes the word in your mouth. Now, if you look in the Old Testament and you find the word, you will find the word meditate quite often. And I looked up, particularly, uh, just Keep this, um, keep this in mind for a little bit later. Psalm 77 is a great psalm about meditation in times of trouble. But the word that comes out, meditate, and I don't know Hebrew. I have very, <laughs> very sketchy on how to pronounce it. But I think it's pronounced hege. And it's sometimes translated meditate. But it's also sometimes translated as to mutter, to moan, to speak. It's a, it's a sound word. It has to do with speech. And that made me think, now, how did people meditate in a preliterate oral culture? Well, how did they learn? They learned because someone spoke it to them, and then they repeated it. They repeated it and repeated it. And this has been true um, well, throughout the history, early history of the church, that repetition was often the only way people knew and remembered scripture. And there were, I've, I've read that in monasteries, there would be um, elderly monks who would be reciting scripture and prayers in their sleep because they did it so much. They knew it so thoroughly. And learning, but not just learning, but remembering and absorbing takes place through hearing. We have a tendency to try to learn through our eyes, but we're not really built that way. We're built to hear and to remember. Why else are those annoying commercial jingles so sticky? That from years back, in your childhood, you could still recall things that you heard on the television in a commercial. Because the more a thing is heard, and the more often it's repeated in your hearing, whether through someone else's mouth or your own, the more ingrained it becomes in your mind and your soul. And whatever ingrains itself becomes who you are. Now, people will say, and um, they've done tests and studies on this, that if you say a thing about yourself often enough, you start to live it. A child who is verbally abused, told that they're stupid, that they're useless, that they're worthless, start to believe it. But so will adults. What people say about you, what people say about themselves, and sometimes, just what you say about things in general 
will ingrain themselves into other people. Flip over to Ephesians chapter four. Now, this is one of those that people tend to take in a couple different ways. Some people will say, well, no, that's just being legalistic. We, we're, we're beyond that now. We, we have evolved as humans. Like, no, you haven't. People haven't changed. But if you look at chapter four, there's one verse in here that I think everyone who takes it seriously will struggle with. Not necessarily just the one, but specifically one. Verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, how often do we scold people for using certain words, but have absolutely no problem whatsoever listening to gossip about people? It's very easy to make a list of words that you can't use. It's harder every time you open your mouth to say, is this going to build people up? Will it bring grace to people? And this word that in the ESV is translated as corrupting, and I, I remember in certain other translations it's unwholesome. I looked it up in the Greek, and it comes, it's, it's sapros, which sadly comes from the same root. And it's one of those things that if you know this, it might actually make it easier for you to control your words. <laughs> it comes from the same root as the English word sepsis. And if you know what sepsis is, it's the rot of living tissue, living cells that are dying. Sepsis is deadly. So are unwholesome words. It's rotten, becomes putrid, and is therefore wholly unfit for use. So the words that you say, if meditation is connected to words, it's very important to keep watch over what you say. Because the words in your mouth become the focus of your life. If you're raised with criticism, you become extremely critical. If you're raised with blessing, you become gracious. And the meditations of your heart that phrase should be very familiar to some of you because you've read that psalm. Get back there. These little thin pages in my Bible are absolutely. <sighs> no, I've, I've not got it bookmarked. So, but the meditations of my heart, may the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Why do you suppose those are paired together? I suspect it's because whatever you're saturated in is bound to come forth in your words. It's bound to be what your mind dwells on. So let's look at Psalm 77. This one I do have bookmarked because that's what I was planning on discussing. Because the natural thing for us <laughs> is to turn to God in times of trouble. 
that's instinctive for us. It tends to come out in, oh Lord, help me, and oh Lord, how long prayers. But when we try to meditate, you can't, uh, emotions being what they are, they do not uh, provide a good foundation for meditation. They're too unsteady. So a good guide for a day of trouble and meditation is Psalm 77. I'll read it out to you just once through. To the choir master, according to Jeduthun, a Psalm of, Z of Asaph. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. It begins with that raw emotion, that crying out to God, the questions, why is this happening? Have you abandoned me? But where does it go from there? The key is this idea that of making a diligent search. And that really is what meditation is. You are searching out the things of God from what you remember, from what you've read, from what you know from your own life and other people's. You are searching out the things of God. This is different from study. Study gets you an understanding of what scripture says, what, what its context is. Meditation takes it just that much deeper and seeks to understand the thoughts of God, not only through scripture, beginning there, and then turning to other things. And part of it is the promises of God. Notice one of those questions, are his promises at an end for all time? Sometimes meditation is a rehearsing of God's promises because we need to remind ourselves. We need to repeat to ourselves, God is good. One of my favorite Psalms, um, I can't even tell you, it's somewhere in, I think one of the 130s. I can't even remember where it's found right now, but it says, you are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. And this is one of the things that I repeat to myself in moments of stress, that God is good, and God does good, and he is teaching me his ways. But the psalmist is like, I've got all these questions, and none of them are very positive questions. They're all about, has he rejected us? Has he turned his back on us? But what he looks to are the things that God has done so far. And some of that is God's creation. 
that he has made wondrous things. If you like being out in nature, you can meditate on the things that God has made. Psalm 19 is an excellent place to start your meditations when you're rejoicing in God's creation. His works in nature, but his works among people. And the psalmist turns to, naturally, one of the most spectacular interventions that God ever did for his people, the crossing of the Red Sea. That no one knew how he had done it, but somehow he brought his people out. And the connection is really obvious there. If he can bring his people out of a situation like that, he can certainly bring me out of whatever situation I'm in right now. And this is one of the reasons why meditating on scripture, taking a passage, a brief phrase, a sentence, a verse, and dwelling on it, repeating it to yourself, considering it, and taking it with you into situations, taking it with you when you're watching the news, taking it with you when you're dealing with people. That this form of meditation keeps us anchored. There are other ways to meditate. There's one that's called uh, centering, where this is the part that you make space from everything that's worrying you, everything that's preying on your mind. You sit still in a quiet place and you take these things and you quite literally, even if you have to say it out loud, you say, God, this is on my mind, I give this to you. And some people will even, you know, do the actions, give. And then there are um, meditating on God's works through current events, where you watch the news, but you watch it with scripture in your mind. Where you watch and, and you say, well, there is no division in Christ. So whatever causes division in this world, we are called to fight. Where you will always have the poor with you, not as a, you know, so never mind that, but so to minister to them. That God is healer when you watch all these, <laughs> and I, I know, you, you watch all these news articles on disease, epidemiology, things like that. God is Lord over all that is made. And he is the healer. The only one sometimes who can bring healing. Where you bring your meditations into everyday life, I suspect you're going to see changes. And that's why I want us to end in Colossians 3. This is a good place to come back to just as a regular thing, Colossians 3, because it says a great deal about how we are to live. There's one thing in particular that it says that I want you to keep in mind, particularly this week. You know, it goes on, it starts with, if you've been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above. We're talking again about that diligent search that you, that, that you pursue in your spirit to understand the things of God better. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. Again, remember, what is the voice in your head? Where does it come from? For those who belong to Christ, it needs to come from above. Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So it talks about, you know, put to death whatever is earthly in you. Ask God to show you your weakness and how to overcome it. Just put on the new self. 
which is being renewed in knowledge. And then it talks about, you know, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness. And it comes down to verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this isn't going to happen if you just skim through a few passages every day and say, I've done my Bible reading. It's not even going to happen if you take a passage and study it closely every day. These are important things. But the word dwells in you when you dwell on it. And there are ways that we can do this. And I know, you know, life is full. <laughs> it gets very distracting. And no one is saying that you need to stop everything all the time and focus solely on you know, a Bible verse. But what it does say is that you bring scripture with you. You teach, you admonish, you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You cherish thankfulness in your heart to God. As you go through the day, do you ever just say, thank you for something to God? It doesn't take long just to acknowledge that something came to you from the hand of God and that you are accepting it with gratitude. And part of it is, it leaks over into what comes in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Part of meditation is just the constant remembrance that he is with you, close beside you, within your heart. And you would live your life very differently if you constantly had an awareness that Jesus himself was standing behind you with his hands on your shoulders, wouldn't you? But that's the meditative way of life, to live with that constant awareness that he is with you, that his spirit dwells in you. And it becomes your life. The spirit becomes the voice in your head. Who knows what could happen? But I know something's going to happen. Is God is not present in a life without transformation happening. So this week, it's not specifically an assignment, because that just makes it more like a rule. But this week, I want you to make a little space in your life. You can start out just by trying it at a certain time during the day. Where you make a space, 15 minutes even. And this is obviously going to be really hard for people who have small children in the house. This is really difficult for people who have like a, one job that takes up the space of two or um, more than one job or who lives in a in a communal setting like a dormitory but it's important to create that space at the very beginning because this is not a natural thing we're being called to do this is a supernatural thing we need all the help we can get so find a little time, preferably when you're well rested, but for some of us that never really comes. But leave your phone in another room, no computer, no television, no radio. If you bring anything with you, bring your Bible. And choose a verse. that will help you search out something of God. Create the separation by taking some silent time at the beginning where 
you're becoming aware of what's going on inside you. Because you need to be aware of your distractions before you can get them out of the way. And a lot of times we just buzz through life oblivious even to the things that are really, really bugging us. So take some time, become aware of these things and give them over to God. Give them over as often as you have to. If they spring up again, say, oh, sorry, God took that one back. Here you go. I'm not going to deal with that right now. Right now is your time. And then fill yourself up, soak yourself up with that part of scripture that you've brought with you. And see if that doesn't make a difference in the rest of your day. And after that, try to take little moments during the day. A moment here, a moment there, where you give thanks where you consider how good God has been to you in the past and is still in the present and how he will do good to you for all your life. May not be comfortable good. We have to acknowledge that. But once you become, once you belong to him, he is there to make you who you ought to be. And all these things, um, uh, changed consciousness of the world around you, um, awareness of your own inner state, peace and rest, all of these things come as gifts when we have planted ourselves in the presence of God often enough. So that's our week's forecast, if you will. Seek to plant yourself in the presence of God and to understand him, to know his thoughts. Next week, we will be talking, we're going to start talking about prayer. It's been very hard to go through all of these other things without talking about prayer because prayer intertwines all disciplines. Prayer being conversation with God. But we're going to start that discussion next week. We will stop recording now.